What does Judaism say about heaven and hell? What about angels, magic? Is there a purpose to life? If there is, how can we know it? And what is it? I'm the average rabbi, but I wasn't always. I didn't grow up with a religious background, and I didn't know the answers to a lot of these questions, or even if there were answers. When you hear a podcast that's titled, What is Judaism? You might assume that it's geared towards people that aren't Jewish, you know, because a Jew obviously knows what Judaism is, wouldn't you think? Unfortunately, that's not the case. I found that most Jews, including myself growing up, really have the not even the faintest clue of what these ancient traditions really are, what it traditionally has always been, what were the ancient teachings of our people. And this podcast is for the Jew to teach the Jew what are the things that we believe in? What does it mean to be a Jew? And what does Judaism actually consist of? So, as I said, I'm the average rabbi and I'm here with Joe. Hi. Joe, why don't you tell us a little bit about where you came from and what you're doing here? Sure. So, I grew up in a very non religious Jewish household. And so, what I found was that Judaism had always, I'm going to use this phrase, I've used it a few times, but Judaism was always kind of a, a backdrop in a life that I felt was already full of plenty of other things. And so it felt full enough for me until the point at which it didn't, when you've kind of met your more base desires, at some point you recognize that there is something beyond just feeding ourselves the way that animals do. We exist at, to some extent, we exist for more than that. And so this began, I started out as an atheist and I had to accept the idea that agnosticism was a better route to go just from a purely scientific perspective. And that agnosticism turned into a firm belief in God and a creator. And that belief in God actually led me full circle all the way back to Judaism. And so now I've seen so much truth in the tiny little bit that I've been exposed to that I want to learn as much as I can. Yeah, let's talk about that tiny little bit. How long has it been since you started exploring Judaism? Uh, maybe a month and a half. Month and a half. Okay, so what? how would you rate your knowledge of traditional Jewish beliefs and traditions? I'm definitely a beginner. Great. So Joe here on this podcast is going to represent you, the listener. We're going to go through a very classic text, which we'll talk to you about in, in just a minute. We'll use that as a, a launch pad and we'll discuss a lot of other topics that are related. So as we go through this material, Joe's going to be learning a lot of this for the first time and maybe you will too. And Joe's going to have fresh eyes, fresh ears, hearing all this information, and he'll come with his commentary and his uh, insights and questions, clarification questions, and hopefully you'll gain from that too. So what is the text that we're going to be studying? It's called Der Hashem in Hebrew. It's the way of God. And this is not what we would consider an ancient text, meaning it's not from the Talmud, it's not from the written Torah. If you don't even know what the Talmud is, that's fine. We're going to cover all that information. This was written somewhere around 300 years ago, uh, maybe a little bit more. It was written by Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato, who was an Italian rabbi. He was born in Italy in the year 1707. He was recognized as a just a master of all of Jewish thought, and that includes traditional scholarship in Judaism and also the more mystical areas, which we refer to as Kabbalah. He mastered all this material around the age 14. It's rumored to say that he had memorized by heart the entire body of scholarly uh, rabbinic texts and began writing at the age of 17. And his works are considered fundamental for understanding Judaism today. And this is a great text to use as our framework. And one of the great things about him, now it's important to note that when we study this book, 
and we're, we're learning from him, which we'll call him the Ramchal. That's an acronym based on his initials, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato. We call him the Ramchal. These ideas are not his ideas, meaning this isn't his take on Judaism, that he came up with some ideas and revolutionized a new way of thinking about, uh, about Jewish thought. None of these ideas are novel to him. And, uh, and he'll, he fully admits that in his introduction. His great strength was he was able to collect all of these truly ancient ideas and assemble them and systematically organize them in a way that it can now be accessible to the layman. And so, so can I interject? Why wasn't it originally accessible to the layman? So what, what about the original texts that he was drawing on was less accessible? Oh, that's a great question. There really was no formal text that organized all of the concepts of Judaism. They, it was sort of baked into the lifestyle, meaning as the Jewish people developed as a nation and at Mount Sinai, when they all received the Torah together, those were very explicit instructions for how to live in your lifestyle. And the philosophy, the underlying philosophy and understanding of um principles of God and all of those things, a lot of them were were obvious and understood by the people in those generations and handed down to their children and just implicitly accepted. And it wasn't until over various centuries where discussion of overt discussion of philosophy started to show up in, in writings. And those were a bit scattered. And you, you can kind of derive certain philosophical principles based on laws, but it was never compiled in a systematic, organized way until more recently. Got it. I'll be reading the text in the original Hebrew. And as we go, I understand that our listeners here and Joe, also you don't understand uh, just yet all of the original Hebrew. So it's important that I read this in the original text because a lot of the words that he chose were extremely precise. And we'll see that even in the first sentence that we're gonna, we're gonna land on. I'm gonna read it in the original Hebrew. I'll translate as we go. And that will take us to wherever it takes us. And over the course of the entire text, if we get there, which would be fantastic, we will cover the entire body of Judaism and un fully comprehend everything about it. How's it sound? Looking forward to it. Okay, so let's begin. We're going to start with the very beginning of the text here. We're actually going to skip the introduction, and I want to get right into the guts. So what would you think is the first topic that when we talk about what is Judaism, what's the first thing we're going to address here? Probably the first topic in my mind would be uh, the Torah or why, why we use it as kind of the basis, maybe. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Interesting. So the Torah already implies a lot, right? It implies that someone had given the Torah. So really, before we even get to the Torah, we're going to have to deal with the most fundamental concept that could ever exist, which is God. All right. All right. right? That makes a lot of sense. Sure. Is there a God? And how do we relate to that? And what, what does that mean? What does belief in God really mean from a Jewish perspective? Because a, a lot of people have, you know, growing up in, in Western culture, there are a lot of preconceived notions. Um, a lot, especially be, coming from a lot of the imagery that's described in the Torah, there's a lot of the anthropomorphization of... Right, we you know, hear about the voice or the face. Yes, and God having a hand and a strong arm taking us out of Egypt. There's a lot of humanization. It seems like God is some character in the sky that you know, has superpowers and commands us to do things according to his will. And that's pretty distasteful to a lot of people. Um, and it's, and it's not so logical also, but a lot of people assume this. And I think they assume that because when you're four or five years old, hearing about these concepts of God for the first time, there's not much more beyond that, that you could comprehend the abstract idea of an infinite power that transcends physicality is not something that a five-year-old could even come close to understanding. So when you're, when you're five, six, seven, eight years old, learning about God, you have to put it into more concrete terms. Mm, yeah. The problem is we don't often get a sophisticated education beyond that. 
most Americans growing up uh, in right in a in a public school environment, you're not going to be taught complex ideas about religion, and so therefore, almost the contrary, they they try to straw man it to a great extent. I think at this point, true, but I I think a lot of it has to do with this is because a proper education is never given, so therefore people's assumptions about religion and about God is very skewed and flawed because it's coming from a seven-year-old's understanding of theology. <laughs> so that's pretty easy to, to make into a straw man and strike down when you're coming with you know, a PhD in, uh, in anything, right? And putting that against a seven-year-old's understanding of, of God. So this needs to be fully examined, re-examined. What is God? How do we relate to that? So this first line over here, Kol ish mi Yisrael, tzarech min v'yeda. Every single Jew needs to believe and know. Sh'yesham matzu irisham. Kad moin v'nitzchi. That there is a first being preceding everything and eternal. V'hu shehimtzi umamtzi kol ma shenimtza b'amitzius. And that is what brought into existence, brings into existence, everything that exists in existence. Now, if I use that word existence a lot, it's because he did. <laughs> that, that is the word here that's in the text. You might think that the word create would have been appropriate here, right? That he created everything. If you would ask a person to describe, you know, what's God? Oh, God is the creator. Right. That's not the word he chose to use here. He didn't say that the way we relate to God is that God created everything. Well, I noticed there was something where you said past tense brought, and then you corrected that to brings into existence. Is that intentional to imply that this is an ongoing process? It, it, in fact, it wasn't. Yes, it was intentional, and it wasn't even a correction. He says both things. He says he brought into existence, comma, brings into ah. existence everything that exists in existence, in reality. Vehu, and that is Ho'eloka, that's God. That's what we call God, the definition of the word. Yeah, let's break this down, this first sentence, because there's a lot here. Uh, and even in that first phrase, every single Jew needs to believe and know. What does that mean? We're supposed to believe or know, and how do you do both? And what's the difference? What is belief? What is knowledge? How can you have knowledge of this? Isn't it only belief? Uh, that's that's an interesting question. I, I know I had a conversation with a friend at one point where we recognized that there was kind of a flaw, at least in English, that was the only language the two of us spoke, um, where we recognized that there was some difference between believing something because it's what you think is true and you recognize you've chosen to believe that because you think it's true, but you know you don't know it for a certainty. And then there's the more common, uh, or maybe it's more common, but the other type of belief, which is, no, I actually think that this is a fact or or I know this as a fact. I just use the term believe uh, it's there's a distinction there that I don't think English at least does very well. So what do you think he means here? It seems like he's going toward the one where you just know, like knowing something in your bones when you encounter something that someone says to you. And you say, wow, that, that's true, and I know it's true, and I don't know how it's true. You know, true with a capital T. Mm. Uh, I, I think he's aiming for that. Well, he's definitely saying two things. Meaning, if what you're saying is the ultimate goal is to have that level of knowledge, he could have just said, you have to know. But he says you have to believe and know. Hmm. You, you, I think what you were suggesting is that the belief, whatever belief means, would ideally lead you to that confident knowledge but that's not really, that's not what I'm getting from here, right? He, he said, there are two things that need to be in your consciousness. There needs to be a belief and a knowledge. So let, let's talk about both of those. What is belief from a Jewish perspective? Now, the, the very first point we need to make is that it does not mean blind faith. There is no such thing. There's no concept. It's completely illogical to just assume information with no evidence whatsoever. So there is no such thing within Judaism? Right. That's, okay. Yeah. And, you know, if I'm making a sweeping statement like that, I'm coming from Jewish principles. Okay. Right? From a Jewish perspective, there is no requirement to assume knowledge of something without any evidence for it whatsoever. That would be irrational. 
right? So blind faith isn't really the concept. The word for faith or belief in Hebrew is emunah. Emunah really means an extension of truth. I'll give you an analogy. This analogy was given by Rabbi Akiva Tatz. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Rabbi Akiva Tatz. If you guys have heard anything from him, you know what I'm talking about. If not, I recommend going out and listen to some of his classes. He's written a lot of books, great at explaining a lot of difficult concepts. He gives a great analogy to describe the relationship between truth and faith, or in Hebrew, emes and emunah. Emes is complete 100% clarity. For example, a person is walking through a forest, pitch black, middle of the night. He can't see a thing. Far from civilization, there is no sight. Now, this forest is fraught with danger. There are bandits on the road. There are pitfalls. There are wild animals nearby. You have no idea where any of these things are or where mm -hmm. the path is. And you need to walk this path because you need to go back to civilization to get to safety. Now, in a flash of lightning, instantaneously, the entire forest is illuminated. You can see every element of the forest. You see exactly where the path is. You see everywhere where all the pitfalls are. There is no room for doubt. In that moment, you have 100% clarity with no room for doubt whatsoever of the reality that faces you. Okay. It's clear. That is truth. However, lightning is very fleeting. And so therefore, just as fast as it came, that illumination is gone. And the entire forest reverts back to pitch black darkness. Now, I think I might see where you're going with this. Very good. So now you're standing in this forest. How do you know where to go? You're in pitch black darkness. There's no, you can't see anything. There is no truth that is illuminated before you. While that may be the case, you have memory and you have the ability to go back in your mind to a time where you had that clarity and cling on to that truth, which once existed is no longer here, was fleeting and extend that forward and live in a way of truth, even though it's no longer present before you walk it, you know exactly where that path is because you just saw it. You can't see it anymore, mm. but you know where it is. Yeah. Yeah. When you walk that, that is faith. Faith is knowing the truth even when you can't see it, when well, it's not so clear then anymore. The question is, where do we get that flash of lightning? That's an excellent question. That has to come first, right? That's a discussion for another time. Okay. Uh, because I assume you're asking, you know, how do how how is anything that he's about to tell us about Judaism verified? That's yeah, a discussion to some for some extent, right? That's a discussion for another time. Um, very valid question. But for now, let's just get uh, an education about what it is that's, okay. that's in Judaism. Great. So faith is living with truth, even when it's not clear anymore. And so that is very applicable to God. So you asked a valid question, how do we first get the knowledge of God? Good question. However you get that, there needs to be a truth that's verified. And then living with that is faith. Living with that truth, even when you can't feel it, see it experience it in the moment. So that's believing in God. Now, how do you know there's a God? Because he said two things. You have to believe and know these things about God. What is knowledge? So interestingly, there are several words in Hebrew for knowledge. So like people talk about the Inuit population, they have so many words for snow because that's <laughs> their culture. In Judaism, Jewish culture, we have several words for knowledge. This word that he chose, yeda, the word das, is a very specific kind of knowledge. It's the kind of knowledge that you have intrinsically. It's part of who you are. For example, do you know that you love your parents? Yes. How do you know that? Um, you don't have to prove it to me. Okay. But how, how do you know that you know? It's, it's something that's part of me. I like, I, I know it. It's one of those true with a capital T things. I don't, hmm. 
Yeah, not a very scientific answer, is it? <laughs> you can't prove that you know it. You can't even prove it to yourself. But you know that you know it. That's called das. It's, it's not invalid. The fact that there's no scientific proof or there's no reasoning to be able to show or prove even to yourself that it's true does not make it less true. You know that you love your parents because you experience it. In the same way, we can have das of God. In fact, this is a, I think this is lesser known, the famous philosopher, the French philosopher, René Descartes, who said, I think, therefore I am. Mm. He went through what could we possibly know about anything, anything that we know with our senses is out because there are hallucinations. He said, even logic, I could be manipulated by some higher force. Ultimately, he concludes that I know that I exist because even if I'm being manipulated, there needs to be a me to exist. The fact that I'm cognizant of my own existence shows that I exist. Okay. He then went on, this is a lesser known thing, he then went on to prove that there must be God, there must be a creator. Because if I exist, I know that I didn't create myself, and he takes that to its conclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not a logical proof of God either. It's a type of knowledge that is purely experiential. And that doesn't invalidate it. And a skeptic will say, well, whatever you're feeling, you may attribute that to God. But that doesn't mean that, that it is God. You could just be fooling yourself. You could have some sort of feeling that's purely, you know, chemicals firing right. in your, you know, whatever's happening in your brain. And you say, well, that's God. Let's hold off on that. Because we're, we're going to go through a deeper understanding of what the concept of God is. Once we have that, these principles that the Ramchal is going to lay out for us, we'll see how you can't brush it off so easily. See what these principles are and how you could be very directly cognizant and aware, experientially aware of God. And that's what knowledge of God really is. So that's this first line. You know, that's why it's so important to know this Hebrew and to understand these, these concepts from a uh, from a linguistic perspective, the semantics of what ancient Hebrew is and all the connotations that they carry. So again, every single Jew needs to believe and know that there is a first being, a first being, and that's it. What is that being? There's no definition. The only thing that we know so far in terms of these principles is that it's existence. Right? There's no definition to it whatsoever, just that it exists as opposed to not existing. Right. So there is a first existence, which is without beginning. Kadmon means that it precedes everything else. There is nothing else before it. And not only did it precede everything else, Nitzchi, eternal. Now, when we think eternal, we, we tend to think of Really, really, really long time. Uh, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. Just a real long time. Right. So you're like, if you would, if a bird would take one grain of sand from the Sahara Desert and fly to the sun and drop that grain of sand on the surface of the sun and then fly back and take another one grain of sand, how long would it take that bird to empty out the Sahara Desert? Probably not eternity, but really, a really long time. Right. Really, really long time. We think so long, I can't even comprehend that i.e., you know, that equals eternity. But that's wrong, right? Eternity doesn't mean really, really, really long time. Eternity means that it's beyond time. It, it supersedes the concept of time. It's beyond space time. It's not confined to the restrictions of the finite realm. And so that's, that's important to note also. So the, the connotation of Nitzki doesn't mean existed for a long time. It means that the concept of time just is not applicable. This first being brought everything that exists into existence, and that's what we refer to as God. So, so far, we're, we're going to go through some other details, uh, some other principles of how we relate to God, but we're going to start with this. And definitely what we don't see is some character that lives in the sky. Right. Waving right. a magic wand. Right. And, and what's interesting is we're, we're going to spend, in total, he's going to come out with six principles, six distinct principles of how we relate to God. And all of them basically come together to describe infinite. 
which is kind of funny because infinite can't be described at all. Right? It, in fact, it's, it's not a definition. It's the lack of definition. We can't directly relate to a non-concept. Right. So we will have these principles of things that we can relate to. And this is number one. You know, something popped up when you mentioned the defining of the infinite. Why, why is it that we have trouble with that in general? Have you heard, have you heard the concept of definition being like to enclose something? It's why it's at least I extrapolated from that the concept that it's why God is so hard to define. In Hebrew, the word to define, and this is a more modern term, I guess, but it, the word for definition or to define is lahagdir, which literally means to fence in hmm. or to right to create boundaries. That's a perfect word. When you say what something is, you're saying simultaneously all the things that it isn't, uh, and you're you're really building a fence around it. Right. So, I, meaning in other words, in English also, you could say to define something is really to confine it. Yeah. Okay, let's continue. That was number one. Number two. You also have to know. That this existence, this being, it cannot be truly conceived of other than it itself. Meaning a third party can never truly conceive of God. Only God understands God. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to process that right now. And there's, so is this saying we do not, so we do not conceive of God by saying that, or is it just that we don't get the full picture? Because clearly you and I recognize that there is a being and we, and we understand that it may be beyond our comprehension to some extent. Right. Um, I wouldn't normally think of that as being, we don't conceive of God. Well, God, it, the point here that he's making is that God is inherently inconceivable. Okay. Because all of our faculties of understanding anything require definition. Ah. Our minds are finite faculties. Right. So the mind, which is finite, cannot possibly grasp, define, or conceive of anything which is beyond the finite, which is infinite. I see. We can talk about the idea of infinite, but we can't truly grasp it because it's not graspable. Right. Okay. So a human being, being finite, cannot truly understand God. Barak ze noidabo, only this is known about God. Shehu matsui shalem bechol mine shlemus, v'loi nimsa bechisorun kla. That God is perfect in all manner of perfection, and there is no deficiency whatsoever. I'm just soaking that in. Okay. Okay. The following that he says, I'm not going to read this inside, but I'll give you the gist of what he's getting at. He makes the point now that everything that we've been discussing up until now and everything that we will continue to discuss about our understanding of God are things that we have as a matter of tradition from our ancestors that go all the way back to Mount Sinai. Now, the Ramchal says, the author says, that that's not strictly necessary. He says that theoretically, all of these concepts could be demonstrated by logical proofs. But he says, we're not going to get into that. This isn't a a philosophical text to derive the existence of God. What we're here to do is to present the information that is true based on our tradition of it. Okay. How it's true. How do you know it's true? Excellent question. Outside of the scope of this course. Exactly. So he's just making that point here and we're going to continue. So let's recap so far. Number one, there is a first eternal being that exists. That's what we call God. Number two, this being that we refer to as God is inherently unknowable, inconceivable, and only God can conceive of God. Number three, you also must know that this being, that this existence 
is imperative. And it is impossible that God cannot exist. Hmm. Okay. I'm ready for this one. Meaning, I exist. And that's fine. If I didn't exist, theoretically, that wouldn't break the laws of nature. All right. I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with me not existing. I happen to exist. You happen to exist. And anything mm. that it does exist happens to exist. God does not happen to exist. God exists intrinsically. I see. Right? Because anything else that exists, exists because it was created. But something that was not created must exist inherently. So this is a third principle that we understand about the, the nature, so to speak, of God's existence. I see. God must exist. Number four. You also must know that his existence... Now, we say his existence, and this is the first time that I've used a gendered pronoun with God. Uh, there's a reason for that. And we do refer to God as he and him. Uh, now, you could say that in the Hebrew language, there's no word for it. Right? You have to use either he or him. And all objects are considered either masculine or feminine. And so, therefore, there's a masculine it and a feminine it, and it doesn't necessarily imply some sort of uh, animal or being that has a gender. Mm. Words themselves are either masculine or feminine. But one could note that, you know, why is it that we refer to this existence in the masculine as opposed to the feminine? It's a good question. Question. There is a reason for it. Again, it is beyond the scope. I've done a podcast actually with Dan Coleman once upon a time about masculinity and femininity. And this was obviously a, a major point of why we refer to God in the masculine. Uh, you can go check that out. Uh, if you have questions, you can reach out. Uh, I've got to listen to that. Okay, great. So feel free to reach out and, uh, and we can discuss that further. I, I'm not going to discuss it now. It's, it's beyond, again, the scope of our topic here, but it's an interesting point. But I will refer to God as he in the masculine, as, uh, as is customary. So, number four, we also must know that this existence, his existence, not only is God's existence imperative, intrinsic, inherently necessary, but it also does not depend on any other existence. It is completely independent. All right. Again, my existence, we just said ago in, in, in principle number three, it's possible that I could not exist. I happen to exist. I also happen to exist because I was created by something else. Right. So that, you are fully dependent on that other thing. Exactly. Anything that exists in creation that was brought into existence was brought into existence by something else. And so therefore... Anything that exists in reality is a dependent existence. Whereas the only way to have an independent existence is to have existed eternally. And that's God. That makes sense. Okay, so this is principle number four, that not only is the existence imperative, but it's independent. Now, does any of this preclude or imply or explicitly state that God is the only one of these things. That's number six. Okay. <laughs> we're going to get there. I don't want to get ahead of us. That is principle number six. So we're going to get there in just one moment. We're going to go to number five first. All right. Okay. Number five. You also must know. That his existence is a simple existence, the existence of pure simplicity. Without any sort of mixture or multiplicity whatsoever. Hmm. And you know, we mentioned before that God is perfect in all manner of perfection. We mentioned that back in principle number two. Yeah. That seems to imply that there are different elements of God, right? 
all manner of perfection. But that's not really accurate because here what we're saying is that God is completely simple and therefore all manner of perfection that we relate to, for example, the power of strength, right? That's a way that a person could be perfect and they could still be deficient in other areas. All of these manners of perfection are one within God, indistinguishable. So that's interesting because it's reminiscent of what Einstein postulated in his theory of everything because he recognized that there were these totally disparate and disconnected aspects of how the universe seemed to function. You have the large scale explained with relativity and then you have the extremely small scale explained with quantum mechanics and the two cannot possibly exist together. They seem totally disconnected. Mathematically, they could not exist. So he theorized the possibility of the existence of something simple that explained all of it. What was it, the grand unification theory? The grand unification theory. Yeah. It's, it's God. How about that? <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah. So, so he brings the example here. He says, Ki hine ba nefesh yimtsu koichus rabim. Shainim, shechol echad mehem gedeir bifnei atzmei. Because in the human, for example, you'll find many different abilities that each one has its own definition, independent of each other. Derech mashal, for example, has zikar and koich echad, memory is one faculty that a person has, v'aratzon koich acher, and the strength of will is a different ability. And the ability to, to imagine is something else. And they don't interfere with each other at all. Because memory has one definition, has its limitations. And the will has its limitations and its qualifications. And they don't, they don't interfere, they don't enter each other's definitions at all. And so too with all of them. But God does not have different abilities. Even though truthfully, God quote unquote possesses all of the faculties and abilities that we would consider to be separate. For we refer to him as wanting and wise and able and perfect in all manner of perfection. However, the truth of his existence is complete oneness. This is a really important point because when we say, let's say in the Shema, many Jews have, have heard of the Shema. Uh, it's sort of the mantra of the Jewish people. It's a line in the Torah that says, Shema Yisrael, listen, Jew. <laughs> Hashem Elokeinu, the Lord is our God. Hashem Echad, God, the Lord is one. And one might take that to think that there's one God as opposed to many. But that's not really what it means. What it means is that God is unified. God is one. There is only oneness. Uh, in fact, there's another line in the Torah, which is very interesting, that says, Ein od milvado, there is nothing else besides God. God is the existence in complete simplicity. Wow. There's, there's a lot there. Okay, so... God is one, is separate from the concept that there is one God. I think I get that part. Um, and I've always kind of wondered why it was phrased in that way. But that actually, I think, makes sense. The fact that God is this one unified being. From there, there seems to be a jump that God is, God is all of existence. Oh, great. I'm glad you brought that up because this is this is something that a lot of people have have been misled on. And this is not what Judaism teaches. I mean, a person might come to think, okay, therefore, everything is God. Right. That's exactly where I was going with that. 
And that's not accurate. And and this is difficult to understand. It, well, it's it, not just difficult. It's impossible to understand. Um, I, I mean, how could it be that if God is the only existence that exists intrinsically and everything is a creation, so then that should follow that everything really is God, right? Mm. But we can't relate to it like that. We must, as fractal creations, must relate to God as the creator and ourselves as the creation. Because to say that any one thing, to I point to it and identify it as God, would be a limitation and a definition of something which is inherently undefined. Okay. But could you call something a piece of well i guess there couldn't be a piece of god if god is one you know what it's it's funny that you bring that up because we do have in traditional rabbinic literature uh statements like that meaning calling the soul the human soul a piece of god hmm. uh, so we need to at least at this point we need to understand not to take that 100 percent literally because okay. there are no pieces so when we get there, when we get to the soul and all kinds of that's coming much later, then we can try to understand on a deeper level what that really is referring to. But step one is God on God's level, so to speak, is only infinite oneness. Okay. This is a long journey. We can be patient. Certainly. Now, he goes, the rest of this principle, he explains how un this is really incomprehensible. We can't really truly grasp what it means that all manner of perfection are completely one when, you know, relating to God. Uh, but we can at least approach the idea and recognize that, you know, recognize the limitation of our understanding. But I, I think we can, we could take an analogy, which he does not uh, provide, but it is prevalent in some other schools of thought within Judaism, like Hasidus, for example, which is the analogy of light, where you can have pure white light that, when shown through a prism, mm. then breaks up through refraction into many different colors. Yeah. And so you might think, okay, so this light is made up of red and green and blue, and that's not really true. You wouldn't say that the light itself is a composite of red and green and blue. The light is just light. It's all one. It's pure hmm. light. But when it's being filtered through some sort of interface, through a prism, then you can see through perception ele disparate elements. Wow. Okay. So we have to be careful with that analogy because... Again, one could be led to that same dangerous conclusion as pointing to the red and saying that is the light, right? Pointing to this chair and saying that chair is God, which is not, which is not accurate and it would be in fact heretical right. to claim such a thing. So we always have to be aware of our, the limitations of our understanding and recognize that half of the equation is inherently inconceivable because we're talking about the infinite. Okay. And so we shouldn't draw too much on an analogies to be entirely accurate right every analogy has its limitations in the fact that they're all something that we can relate to and we always have right. to understand that half the equation is something that we can't relate to at all okay but soon we'll, we'll come to a more concrete way of approaching this whole topic and understand that there are two ways of talking about god one is god intrinsically which we can't really talk about because that's infinite and there's no words mm. to describe any of that. Mm. And then another is how we relate to God from our perspective, from within the perspective of the creation. From this side of the prism. Exactly. And that's the only thing that we can talk about. So this is just a spoiler. We'll talk more about this later. Any sort of description that we have about God, like he mentioned earlier, that God ha possesses strength and is wise and all of those things. All of those concepts only exist within the realm of our reality that we exist in, within creation, after the creation, so to speak. Um, that's all from our perspective. What he's laying out now is knowing the ultimate truth, which is that God is infinite. And that's inherently inconceivable, and we have to be aware of that as well. So we're always living with this dichotomy of us relating to God in the ways that we can 
from our perspective, but always knowing that it's inherently inconceivable. Okay. Now, number six you already brought up is to know that in addition to God's existence being completely simple, there cannot be another being that possesses these qualities. There, this being that is, has all of these qualities that was eternal, is eternal, I should say, uh, was, is, will be eternal, mm. uh, can only know itself, cannot be truly known or understood by something external. Number three, whose existence is imperative and intrinsically necessary. Number four is that the fact that it's intrinsic and, impar and imperative is also independent, was not created by anything else. Does not, its existence does not depend on any other existence. Number five, that the existence itself has no disparity, is completely unified. There can only be one being that possesses all of those qualities. And it seemed like we were getting toward or getting closer to that concept that there could only be one of these with each one of those things, which is why I asked if, if this was explicitly said. So thank you. Yes. So these are the six principles. And this is the foundation for what we call monotheism, right? And you asked a question earlier, was, was Judaism the first monotheistic religion? And the, the answer is yes and no. If you'll ask scholars, they'll, they'll point to other religions that had a belief in one God. They, they could you know, maybe find one that predates Judaism. That might be true. But here's the thing about monotheism. Who is the father of monotheism? Who started all of this? Abraham. Who, Abraham, right? Abraham is considered the father of monotheism. And he was, uh, he was almost killed for it. He was sentenced to death by Nimrod. Now, what was he saying that was so radical? Because as a matter of Jewish tradition, we say that the entire world understood these six principles about the creator of the universe. This wasn't a novel concept that there is an infinite creator that precedes all existence, that is eternal, etc. All of these principles were well known. So the concept that there is one infinite creator was not novel in mm. his time. People recognized it. So it seems like if this came from Abraham, is that and, and that these six concepts were not new to humanity at large, were, were other nations or people who did not end up becoming the Jews, were they given the seeds of this knowledge? Could this have developed? Elsewhere, I guess, is what I'm getting at. These principles, yes. Now, what a monotheistic religion is, is something totally different. And that's yet to come. Okay. So we'll, we'll understand a lot more what a monotheistic religion is later on, what Abraham was really doing, why it was so revolutionary, and why he was almost killed for it. And that's for a later date. But for now, this is a great introduction. I think we covered the first chapter in laying out the fundamentals of how we relate to God, at least uh, on a theoretical level. And we'll see you next time. Wait, what are we, what are we covering next time? We'll talk about 